Oh, hello there. Tonight, we're going to be reading chapter 27. And by tonight, I mean now, for tonight. Now, these Facebook Live videos, in the comfort of a home, hopefully will go on without a hitch. So, tonight is chapter 27 of Mr. Tweedy. With the robbery puzzle solved, and my own in innocence proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, things should have been fine. However, despite the way things had turned out, by noontime I had become obsessed with an urge to get out of there. No matter how much I tried to forget the young man, forget how much I liked him and trusted him, forget how he had used my friendship for his evil purpose, I simply couldn't put him out of my fevered mind. I kept thinking about what might have happened if I had loitered on my way back to the park, giving the young man time to get away from the police. Without question, I would have been held, perhaps even imprisoned, as an accomplice to his crimes because no amount of talking could have changed what someone in the park had seen. My stopping outside the park to receive the packages. This, according to one of the residents, was why the police had been called. Someone who had suspected the young man all alone had seen us talking together several times, had accidentally witnessed the packages being sur sur surreptitiously handed into the car beyond the park exit. This had looked fishy enough, but then, of course not knowing what, that I was sick, seeing me put my head down into my hand made him think that I was trying to hide my face. Anyway, he, for one, was absolutely convinced that I was in cahoots with the thieves. Even after the loot was returned, he still acted as though he didn't believe my innocence. Being nearly delirious from the heat and my fever, I began imagining that others were also thinking me a criminal, and on the spur of the moment I decided we wouldn't wait to finish out our week. This very night we would pull out of that miserable place. If this proved to one man that I really was guilty, then fine. He could remember me as a clever accomplice who got away. Of course, leaving Phoenix that night at 8.30, presumably to cross the desert to California before daylight, was unquestionably the most stupid act of my lifetime. However, by then, I had been sick from the sunstroke for 24 hours without sleep for 36 hours. The day's temperature had been well over 100 degrees. My own temperature must have been likewise, and all in all, I was more fit to be in a hospital as a patient than behind the wheel of a car. However, by that time, my mind wasn't functioning clearly. All day, while preparing the trailer for traveling, I had filled up on nothing but cold, black coffee. To be sure, the children and Mr. Tweedy had eaten well, but I hadn't touched a single bite of food. By 8.30, I was functioning purely on a coffee jag. No more, con no more conscious of what I was doing than I had been, th than had I been on automation. How I ever managed to get the car attached to the trailer, I don't remember. Nor do I recall leaving the Bonzo cooler in the park office for Betty and Bill to pick up later. But the children assured me that I did. However, ridiculously, I do remember the last minute bit about Mr. Toad. Some youngster in the park had found a horned toad and presented it to Dave to take home. At this time, I didn't know that a horned toad is another thing that is protected by law and forbidden to be kept in capti captivity, so I wasn't worried about another crime. However, the boy had told the children that this grotesque little creature had a unique means of defense. If attacked, he would spit blood in the attacker's eyes, thereby blinding them. Whether or not this was true, I didn't know, but I was averse to the idea of being spat at or having the children spat at with blood, or even a blood-colored substance. When it was time to leave, the children begged me to let to let them keep Mr. Toad. He hadn't done any spitting, and Kathy wanted to take him to school to show her to show to her biology teacher. So ultimately, as usual, the children went out. Anyway, having a fifth passenger added to our to our group might prove a blessing if Mr. Tweedy suddenly decided that he'd have that he'd had enough trailer. Thus, at the very last minute, there was a mad rush to with the children trying to fill up a small jar with live ants for the funny looking toad. <clears throat> the next thing I remember is the acrid smell that seemed to permeate the air as we drove out of Phoenix. Thereafter, I have no recollection about the miles we covered until we got to a place called Quartzsite. Here, it seems to me, there was a crossroad and some sort of, tr of tavern, across from which I had to stop and insisted that we all go t into the trailer to rest. However, this being in the middle of August in the desert, the heat was something out of this world. The inside of the trailer was like a furnace. How long we stayed in it, I don't know. Dave tells me too long, which tells me nothing time-wise. Time 
Anyway, while they evidently tossed and turned on the lower bunk, the top one being impossible for Dave to tolerate, I thought I wrote volumes in my travel log when actually I, I scrawled only three words across the full page. I don't remember writing those words. God help me, but I do remember one thing distinctly about that stop. Unlike the vague bits and pieces I can barely recall, this memory stands out vividly. As I got behind the wheel of the car, I was suddenly swept by the realization that something was terribly wrong with me. I was burning up with fever. The pain in my head was excruciating, and yet I felt like the pain belonged to someone else. I didn't know how I had driven us into this inferno, and I knew even less how I could drive us out of it. My next dim recollection is a timeless line of pinpoint lights glimmering through the darkness. Evidently, there were many other cars crossing the desert that night, and their lights looked like a string of pearls against a black velvet tapestry. At daybreak, I stopped at the California state line where the car and trailer were checked out to see if we were carrying any fruit. And the children tell me that when the officer asked if we had any oranges or lemons, I foolishly answered, Yes, we have a little cactus. The way Kathy told me, my head was wobbly and my eyes were glassy. It's a wonder he didn't arrest me for, po for possible drunkenness. Shortly thereafter, with the blazing sun climbing the heavens, the heat got beyond description. At this point, my fever must have, been, must have soared to its limits. I kept begging the children for ice, not one piece to hold in my mouth. I wanted to be packed in it. During our stay in Phoenix, I had purchased an insulated picnic chest within which, somewhere, we had filled with the most expensive ice cubes the children had ever heard of. I don't remember making any stop. I don't even remember begging for the ice. However, evidently I did, and with the chest full of ice, the children proceeded to pack it around me. Kathy put some on my lap and around my thighs and then took chunks and rubbed them up and down my legs. Dave stuffed a load, load of it down my back. Being a child, he didn't realize the seriousness of my condition. Being a boy, he thought it tremendous fun to be putting ice down my back and getting away with it. When I, when I begged him to pour ice water over my head and hold ice cubes against my neck, this was the utmost. Of all this, I know nothing except a vague memory of hearing Kathy say, When Mommy wakes, I, wakes up, I hope she doesn't get mad at us. All this while I was driving the car across the Mojave Desert. When Mr. Tweedy was, where Mr. Tweedy was during the 100-mile ice pack drive, they did, Dave didn't know. Kathy says he spent most of the time in the flower bowl just sitting in the water to which she kept adding bits of ice. Anyway, he survived the ride in better shape than the children. When it was over, they were exhausted, and he was full of the dickens. By the time we reached Indio, California, the ice had done its work, the fever had broken, and I found myself sitting in a pool of water on a postery that was soaked from top to bottom and front to back. When I finally realized where I was, out of curiosity, I asked the children how my driving had been. Kathy said it was fine. Dave said I had never driven better in my life. With the heat still terrible, although nothing like it had been in had been the heat bit had been in the heart of the desert, we decided to splurge and spend the, the rest of the day and that night in an air conditioned motel. At a garage while the car was being serviced, I went into the trailer and changed from head to foot. Then with plastic bags all over the seat, I drove on until we reached a nice motel. While the three of us had been had a few hours of sleep, Mr. Tweedy enjoyed himself bathing in the bathroom sink, eating cheese from a TV tray, flying all around the room, and, in general, making a mess of the place. When we awoke, we spent half an hour locating calling cards and removing them. When we returned <clears throat> from a long, refreshing swim in the pool, having left him asleep on top of his cage, we went through the same procedure before we retired for the night. At least we knew he had eaten well and exercised heartily. That ends the reading for chapter 27 of Mr. Tweedy. Tune in tomorrow for chapter 28, and then we'll be reading chapter 29, and then chapter 30. This book only has 30 chapters, so we'll be finishing Mr. Tweedy this week. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Mr. Tweedy and learning about how this little bird had been tamed and had been um, a, really bless a, a real blessing for this family. Now let's end with a bedtime prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the things that we have experienced. Um, I ask that you be with um, all the children tonight. Help them to get a good night's sleep. I ask that you be with their parents. And Lord, I just pray for everyone to get a good night's sleep and wake up feeling refreshed, revi revived, and ready to take on the day. Lord, thank you for this book that is teaching us so many things about animals and family and traveling and all these funny things and, and sometimes scary things that happen to this family, but they get through it. Lord, help us know that we can get through it as well. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good night, and I'll see you tomorrow.